The drivers of the two cars sat and glowered at each other after the crash. Most of the glowering was done by the big man in the sedan with the Pennsylvania license plates. He was a beefy, bull-necked man, which is a botanical name for a road hog. The girl in the shell of the other car, a smart roadster, whose metal plates bore the name of Virginia, spelled all the way out in full, had turned first to make sure that the gray-haired soldierly-looking man in the seat beside her was unhurt. Assured of this, she calmly waited for the other driver to say something. Obviously, there wasn't much he could say. He simply hadn't given half the road. To which fact, the position as well as the state of the two machines bore silent but eloquent testimony. As for the girl, well, she just wasn't taking the ditch today, thank you. After all, the Dixie Highway is wide enough for any two cars to pass, and Ann Houston wouldn't meekly run into the gutter for any road hog. And her age companion, the ex-Confederate captain, felt the same way about it. After some minutes of blustering and bluffing, the road hog finally mumbled an admission that he carried liability insurance. Andy produced a card bearing his name and his address. Joseph Bridal, 412 Main Street, Philadelphia, dealer in antiques. Meanwhile, a sizable crowd had gathered. The crash had occurred on the outskirts of a sequestered village of Boonesboro, Tennessee, where the bumping together of two motor cars, oh, that's a news item, and the collision of two cars driven by foreigners, well, that's an event good enough for two columns in the weekly beacon. Willing hands pushed the disabled machines to a nearby garage. The bewhiskered mechanic leisurely surveyed the crumpled fenders, the bent axles, and the stretched steering gear, and he spit some tobacco thoughtfully. And he opined that both cars might be ready for the road in three, four hours, maybe. And that's how it happened that three strangers were left to find whatever of interest might be unearthed in this straggling hamlet nestled at the foot of the Appalachian Mountains. Not that it was a dull day in Boonesboro. Nay, verily, it was the high tide of activity and excitement. You see, court was in session. From the river bottoms to the shut-in coves, the whole countryside, lawyers and litigants, jurors and witnesses, horse traders and produce buyers, everybody who had any business and twice as many who had no business had come to town. The streets were lined with rusty cars, wobbly buggies, and covered wagons. In the midst of the tide of noise and confusion and dust, like an island of shade and comparative calm, rose the quaint old courthouse. Its clock tower stood high above the columns, and it towered almost as high as the great maples that surrounded it. The grassy yard was thronged with folks who couldn't find a standing place inside of the sweltering courtroom. The crowd milled about restlessly. Little groups formed here and there, howdying and gossiping and wisecracking. Every once in a while, the crowd would be brought to attention by the voice of the sheriff issuing a summons from the second story window. Hear, hear, the judge wants Richard Forgey. Come to court. Ann Houston and her grandfather, Captain Stanford of Hillsville, Virginia, strolled into the courtyard up the stone steps and into the crowded lobby. The place reeked of stale tobacco juice and pipe smoke of yesteryear. Near the foot of the stairway was a bulletin board covered in legal notices, advertisements for bids on road construction, list of delinquent taxpayers, notices of public sales, and speaking dates of political aspirants. One notice, scrawled in bold through unpracticed hand, was attracting considerable attention among the hangers on. Presently, Anne and the captain edged close enough that the girl read the notice aloud. Whereas on the fifth day of October 1928, one Elroy Kimry and his wife Samantha did convey bargain and sale to the undersigned trustee, the here and after described property for the payment of $45. And whereas Elroy Kimry and his wife has defaulted on the payment of the said note, now therefore, by virtue of the authority invested in me as trustee, I will expose an offer for sale at high noon in front of the courthouse in Boonesboro on the 16th day of June, 1930, at public outcry for the high dollar, the aforementioned property, to wit, two bed stands, one stove and vessels, two tables, one child's cradle, five plain chairs, one rocking chair, one cupboard, and one chest of drawers. Signed, 
Alex Hatsford, trustee. Why, Granddad, exclaimed the girl jokingly. How exciting. The sale is today, June 16th, and it's only a few minutes away until high noon. Let's go out and see the proceedings. I've never attended a public sale before. Well, I did, the captain replied. Only, your grandmother and I weren't just spectators on that occasion. Sadly, we had to play the role that Elroy Kimmery and his wife, Samantha, will be playing today. Oh, yes. I've heard Mama talk about that. It happened before she was born, didn't it? Yeah, some years before. Your grandmother and I were just married. And it was just before I went to the war. But once I got back, everything had happened. The Union soldiers, they had taken everything we had. All our horses were stolen. Our barn had been burned. And our money was worthless. I did the best I could to hold things together. Oh, but it couldn't be done. We finally had to sell most of our furniture. Including a piece of furniture that your great mother greatly loved. It was all sold at auction in order to restock the farm. We never got that furniture back. And a public sale has never been exactly a sporting event for me since that. I know, Granddad. Mother used to tell me of the old, lovely things that she should have inherited, but she didn't. Some of them had come from England, hadn't they? And most of them had been in the family since before the revolution. I wonder if these Kimrys, whoever they are, are giving up their heirlooms. The list on the bulletin board doesn't seem pretentious, but it would mean a lot if it was everything that somebody had. Outside, two men were arranging articles of furniture along the iron fence inside the courtyard. Well, there's the stuff to be sold, evidently, remarked the captain as he and Anne followed the crowd towards the spot. The household goods proved to be a pathetic assortment of the poorest of the poor domestic equipment. The bedsteads were riggedy affairs with wooden slates. The chairs were third-rate specimens of the native chairmaker's art with sagging split bottoms. The kitchen cupboard of quaint three-corner design was black with years of wood smoke. The ancient relic gave off a heavy mixed odor of parched coffee, garlic, and rancid bacon. The largest piece of all was the one listed as a chest of drawers. It seemed strangely out of place in the lowly company it was keeping. To be sure, it was sadly weathered and scarred as any of the other ones. Yet, any novice could instantly recognize that it was the product of a true cabinet maker's skill and quickly placed the piece as American Empire, a style that was somewhat uncommon in the South, but occasionally found its way there among the descendants of the pioneers. Oh, it was beautiful black walnut. It was massive with paneled ends and rested upon heavy, bracketed feet. Its only ornamentation was an oval carved in each panel and delicate beadwork from the top to the bottom of otherwise plain corner post. The brass pulls were black with tarnish. The whole piece was dingy and discolored as if it might have sat in a room for years where cooking, eating, and washing and all other domestic activities went on. Oh, Granddad, Anne whispered. Look at that empire chest. It's a pitiful old wreck, but isn't it a dream? Yeah, it's probably the last link that binds the present poverty to a forgotten prosperity, the old captain muttered aloud. Here comes the Kimmery family, Anne went on. Their poor home has been stripped to the floors and the walls. Everything they've inherited or acquired to make life a little bit easier is piled up and is going to be sold to satisfy a wretched little debt, most likely to some landlord for the rent of a worn-out hillside field. Yeah, I know the feeling, the gray-haired warrior answered softly. There was a stir in the crowd. Suddenly a man in a flashy suit shouldered his way through the gate and he mounted an upturned box. It was easy to guess that he was the auctioneer. His voice was like the bull of basin. Ladies and gents, he boomed. Pursuant to notice published according to law, it becomes my painful duty to expose an offer for sale. The property here displayed to satisfy a debt of one Elroy Kimry and his wife. The terms of the sale is strictly cash in hand, and everything goes for the high dollar. The spectators crowded around the improvised auction block. Loafers from the street swelled the throng. Court had adjourned for the day, and the yard was filled with onlookers. Step right this way, ladies and gents, called the auctioneer. Here's your chance to provide your home with some good, plain, substantial furniture for pert near nigh nothing. As the feller says, some goes up, and some goes down, but it all goes in a lifetime. Anne Houston was watching the family of Elroyd Camry 
The husband and the father sat on a bench and bit off a big chew of tobacco. His wife, Samantha, vigorously chewed on her snuff stick. The children, too numerous to count, were scattered all around, ranging from a grown boy to a round-eyed youngin' who sat on the mother's lap. Now the auctioneer now focused attention on one of the bedsteads. Here we are, ladies and gents. Do you see this nice, well-made bedstead? Nothing fancy or fine, but just as stout and sturdy as a new one. And it's going for whatever you say. Now I know there's some young folks in this crowd that's aiming to get spliced real soon. And here's your chance to make a start on furnishing your home now. Step right up and look it over. A hubbub of onlookers greeted this pleasantry. A gawky man who had been eyeing the furniture from afar now edged closer. Another bidder ran through the crowd. Everybody knew that Daly McClacken had been talking to Arlene McDonald for some months and that a wedding was in the offing. How much am I offered for this bedstead? Roared the auctioneer. Talk up, folks. This is your lucky day. Two dollars and a half, the young Daly ventured timidly. All shucks, Daly, the auctioneer protested in mock indignation. What you want to waste my time for? Now make me a real offer. I know some of you fellas wants a bedstead. Three dollars. A middle-aged farmer spoke up, and the bidding began all over again. Three and a half, Daly came back, a bit louder this time. Four dollars, the farmer countered after a pause. Sakes alive, folks, the auctioneer called out sarcastically. Here's a couple fellas that wants me to just give away a fine bedstead for a wedding present. Four and a half, Daly piped boldly. His competitor hung back, and after a moment, he walked away. Sold, the auctioneer shouted to Daly McClacken who carried it to the side. The second bedstead, the chairs and the rusty stove were quickly disposed of. The cupboard went to the farmer for 50 cents. The child's cradle was next to be brought forward. It was a rough box, about four feet by two and a half, and it was mounted on some homemade rockers. Again, the auctioneer started. Now we're getting to the good stuff, folks. Where's Daly McClacken at? Oh, there he is under that tree guarding his new bedstead. Come back here, son. Here's the rest of your bedroom suite. Daly came forward, greeted with lighthearted laughs. And in a moment, he was declared the successful bidder against the farmer for the cradle. He calmly took it away and placed it beside the bedstead. Samantha's dull eyes followed the cradle until it disappeared from view. When she turned her face to the auctioneer again, he had placed the chest of drawers beside the block. Anne Houston noted instantly that the mountain woman's expressionless face had visibly softened. That parting look at the old heirloom, which, despite years of incredible abuse and neglect, had grown to be a piece of the poor creature's heart, she thought to herself. And it had been too much for even the mountain woman to take. Anne's own heartstrings were taut with the tug of the mute tragedy. Samantha turned an appealing gaze upon the auctioneer, and her closed set lips worked convulsively for a second. Then with a sob, she buried her face in her naughty hands. The wings of pity must have stirred the heart of the auctioneer. At any rate, his manner changed. His cheap manner was gone entirely as he proceeded to dispose of the last remaining article. Now, ladies and gents, there's just one thing left, and I've been keeping it back for the last and the best. It's this nice, handsome chest of drawers, which every one of you will agree is a plum, elegant piece of furniture for any home in the country. The crowd showed signs of deepening interest. Several women, wives of comfortable farmers, began to inspect the chest critically. Meanwhile, the auctioneer's attention was drawn to a beefy, bull-necked, big-nosed stranger who had pushed his way forward and touched her grandfather's arm. See, Granddad, she whispered. There's our friend, the Roadhog Antiques dealer, and he's got a wicked gleam in his eye. I'll be darned if he isn't watching his chance to gobble up this relic. Well, he'll be able to grab it for next to nothing, the captain replied. There won't be much competition. Anne felt a flush of indignation. It's none of my business, of course, but it fairly makes me boil to see him drop in here and pick up a genuine antique for nothing, just because none of these people have the slightest idea of his value. Well, here goes, folks, the auctioneer shouted. What am I offered for this chest of drawers made of genuine walnut? The solidest, lastingest wood there is. Most likely a hundred years old and good for another hundred. How much am I bid? Five dollars. A decent looking farmer announced after his wife had whispered something in his ear. I'll make it seven. Called another. Eight dollars. Eight fifty. The first bidder bent to hear another word from his wife. 
and he shook his head. The auctioneer waited a moment, mopped his brow. Eight and a half, ladies and gents. You couldn't buy it new for less than 40 over there at that general store. Why, folks, are you going to let this unheard of bargain go for a handful of mere chicken feed? Come on now, good people, and look at it. The canny hill folks looked, but nobody raised the bid. The auctioneer kept up the haggling on and on, but the bidding was over. 850, do I hear nine? Somebody give me nine. 850 going once, 850 twice, nine dollars. A new voice interposed. The voice had a brisk, foreign quality that contrasted sharply with the flat draw of the natives. The mountaineers started craning their necks to see the stranger. And for the second time that day, Ann Houston frowned into the face of Joseph Bridle, a Philadelphia dealer in antiques. Now that's more like it, folks, the auctioneer exclaimed. Nine dollars I'm offered by the gentleman that knows a good piece of furniture when he sees it. Now who will make it ten? Nobody spoke, though people jostled with one another for a better look. The auctioneer haggled a little more, and he finally began. Nine dollars once, nine dollars twice, nine... Suddenly, a woman's voice spoke, quietly, but clearly. Twenty dollars. The words thrilled the crowd like an electric shock. Even the hard-boiled auctioneer gasped, but only for a fraction of a second. Now that's business, ladies and gents. There's some folks here that knows furniture. The lady bids twenty dollars. What do you say, good people? Fifty dollars. Joseph Bridle's face was red with annoyance and determination as he spat out the words viciously. One hundred dollars. Ann Houston called as quietly as before. Elroy Kimberly had stopped chewing. He stood transfixed with the tobacco quid bulging out of his cheek like a tumor. His wife lifted her eyes, red with weeping, and she stared in amazement. One hundred and fifty dollars. The antiques dealer shot back angrily. And that's twice what the blame reproduction is worth. Two hundred dollars. Came Ann's even response. The onlookers were dumbfounded, but Joseph Bridal, his face was like a thundercloud, and he shrugged his shoulders, and he slid away as if he was leaving the scene. Two hundred dollars, the auctioneer chanted. Two hundred once, two hundred twice. The disgruntled dealer in antiques, however, he wasn't ready to give up a genuine American empire. He turned on his heel, and he snapped one final offer. Two hundred and twenty-five dollars and he almost shook his fist in Ann's face. But Ann was done. Truth be told, she hadn't really set out to outbid him on the piece. It had only been her resolve to foil his little game and to make him pay a fair price for what she knew he so greedily coveted. She felt a glow of elation. She had made him pay. 225, roared the auctioneer. 225 once, twice, three times going, going. $250. <laughs> A new voice broke in, and it was a man's voice. The auctioneer whistled in undisguised amazement this time. Joseph Bridal looked like he had been hit with a brick. Anne couldn't believe her ears. Was that really Granddad's voice? Then she saw he had slipped away, and he was standing beside the chest of drawers. His hands were torn with one of the blackened brass pulls. She hadn't been mistaken. The auctioneer's closing formula was droning in her ears. Two fifty once, twice. Three times, going, going, and gone, gone, ladies and gentlemen. To the gentlemen here, the sale is now closed. The country folks began to disperse, but their tongues were wagging merrily. Have you ever seen such bidding before? Never in my life. What in thunder do them crazy nuts want with that old thingamajig anyhow? Oh, them city folks, they just go plumb loony over old things just because they're old. Why? A fella from Knoxville gave me $10 once for a rusty old candle mold. And we've been using it as a coal lamp for the last 30 year. Well, anyway, it sure was a lucky day for Elroy and Samantha. When Ann reached her grandfather's side, he was counting off a roll of bills into the receptive palm of the auctioneer, who in turn was scrawling the word paid across Elroy's debt. And then he delivered to Elroy the balance of 200 and odd dollars in cash. Elroy had resumed chewing and he stuck the roll in his pocket as nonchalantly as if such transactions were a daily occurrence. Samantha's face was a study in gray. Anne could hold it no longer. Why, Granddad, what on earth? Didn't you see my game? I knew that the great hog was simply just bound to have that chest, and I made up my mind he was just going to pay for it. Oh, yes, I saw that. The old soldier smiled. But all at once, I got interested in that chest, and I decided I'd have it myself. The crowd had now gone, 
except for Elroy and Samantha and the youngest child who clung tight to the mother. The look of dazed wonder in the mountain woman's lusterless eyes broke through the Virginia girl's resolve. Impulsively, she threw her arm around Samantha's shoulder. Oh dear, I know it was cruel to hurt you, but we were only trying to see that you got what it was worth. The wife gave her a puzzled look, then a light of understanding broke, and she said with a smile, Law, missy, you mean that old chest of drawers? Why, bless your soul, honey. I wouldn't have hauled it home even if it wouldn't have sold. But my dear, you cried when they put it up to be sold. No, no, missy, that wasn't what I was blubbering about. But when they put my cradle up for sale, I had to cry just a little bit. As ridiculous as it was, I've rocked 11 youngins in that cradle, and it don't look like I'll never have no more. But doesn't it hurt you to give up this fine old chest of drawers that must have been in your family for generations? Law, no, missy. I'm proud to get rid of it. I like purty things myself, not worn out things like that. Well, I'm so glad for you, Anne said with a mist of joyous tears in her eyes. But by the way, could you tell us the history of the old chest? It must have some story connected to it. No, ma'am, it ain't got much history. There was this young captain up in Virginia. I don't remember his name, but right after the Civil War, he had to sell all his furnishments. My pa wanted it auction, and then he moved to Tennessee and he brought it along, and we couldn't get rid of it. Anne began to see the light. My granddad, you mean you recognized? Come on, dear, we must be going. He answered a bit brusquely to conceal the tremor in his voice, and as they moved away, he confided softly. Of course I recognized it. Now come along. Let's go pick up our car and load this chest up. I want to get it cleaned up. I can't wait to see the look on her face when I give it back to your grandma.